Okay, so first the midterm. Well, unfortunately, on Saturday, all the large enough classrooms are occupied by the chemistry exam. So we will not be able to do it on Saturday. So I would propose to shift it just one day on to the Sunday. Hmm? So when would you like to have? Morning, afternoon? Yeah. Probably in the morning at 9.30. 9.40. Okay, at 10. Well, you see, 13 is kind of the lunch time. You will be hungry to ask for extension. Hmm? Well, let's do it like this. We start at 9.40, it ends at 30. So if you want to come at 10, that's, that's fine. You will have three hours. <laughs> so we will most probably be in this one of the classrooms here. So I will let you know when I just finalize it. And hopefully this week I will be uploading all the videos that I haven't uploaded yet. Yes, any questions? Now, if you remember last week, the last things we had done was we looked at the curl and the divergence of the magnetic field, and we had seen that the divergence of the magnetic field was zero. Well, the proof we had was based on the fact that B, we showed that we could write B as the curl of B0 over 4 pi, J of R prime divided by R minus R prime, D cubed R prime. Since it is the curl of something, its divergence is automatically zero. And furthermore, we calculated the curl of B, and we showed that this was equal to 4 pi over C times J. Or in integral form, both of these we, could, we can also write as, well, the divergence of B equal to zero just means that take any closed surface and integrate B over the say over that closed surface and you would get zero. Well, this basically implies that the uh, field lines corresponding to this B field, they cannot start at a given point or terminate at a given point. They have to form closed loops or go to infinity. And then we had the curl equation, curl of B is equal to four pi over C times J. So this allowed us that if you imagine any closed loop and integrate b over that closed loop, this was equal to 4 pi over c times the enclosed current by the loop. And this enclosed current by the loop is in fact nothing but the integral of j over the area that the loop encloses. So these were the last things that we had done. We had studied about the magnetic field. And then just like you, we use the Gauss law to calculate the electric field for highly symmetric cases, we could use this law to calculate the B field, again, for highly symmetric cases. Like for a current carrying wire, infinite straight wire, just using this law, we could obtain the, the B field in just a couple of lines. And also for if we have this uniform sheet like this infinite plane that carries a charge density that is moving at constant velocity for this system. Also, we could just obtain the B field in just a couple of lines. Now, any questions?
Okay, now today what we will be doing is we will study this quantity over here. Well, you see, we proved that the divergence of B was equal to zero by showing that B could be written as the curl of something, but it is kind of a two-way proof in the sense that if B can be written as the curl of something, then its divergence is zero. If the divergence of B is zero, then it can be written as the curl of something. So if divergence, since divergence of B is equal to zero, B can always be written as the curl of what we will call the A. This is our vector potential. You see, if you compare it with electrostatics, in electrostatics we have the curl of the electric field was equal to zero, and hence we said that we can always write the electric field as minus the gradient of some potential, some scalar function, which we call the potential. Now, in this case, curl of B is non-zero, so we cannot write B as the gradient of some scalar function, but the divergence of B is zero, and hence we can write it as the curl of some vector function. But you see, the curl of the divergence is always zero. The curl of the gradient is always zero, sorry. So the curl of A is also equal to the curl of A plus the gradient of, let's call F. So this vector potential corresponding to a given magnetic field is basically not unique. So there are infinitely many of them. In the case of the uh, electrostatic potential, we had this freedom, we could just add any constant to our potential. So as long as it was constant, it didn't change the electric field. Now in this case, we have a larger degree of freedom in the sense that to this vector potential, we can add the gradient of anything we like. And since the curl of that gradient will be always zero, it will not change the vector potential. So this transformation, if you have one vector field, let's say, let's call it A0, then you can change it to another vector field by adding the gradient of a function is what is called a gauge transformation. Now, we will not be studying these gauge uh, transformations in detail, but you will see these gauge transformations quite often in your other studies also. So this is kind of nice. This allows us to impose more conditions on our vector potential. Well, it's both nice and sometimes a nuisance because the, there are basically infinitely many vector potentials that describe the same magnetic field. We can choose any one that we like. So we are just free to make that choice, and we usually make such a choice by imposing conditions on the vector potential. So these are just conditions that we impose because we like them. Now let's try to find what this vector, pot the equation that this vector potential satisfies. So you see, we, once we write B as the curl of this vector potential, we already satisfy the first law, divergence of B is always zero. So that equation is solved by just setting a, a b to the curl of a. It is solved. Now we need to solve the second one. We have to choose a such that it satisfies the second equation. Now let's see, curl of curl, curl of a. This is our b. Now we can expand this double cross product uh, it will be equal to the uh, gradient of the divergence of A minus the Laplacian of A. And this should be equal to 4 pi over C times A, times J. Sorry, mu zero over 4 pi times J. So this is just our vector identity. Now this Laplacian operator we already know. We are kind of familiar with it from electrostatics. This is an additional term which, well, it doesn't look nice. 
So it would be nice if this was absent. Yeah? Do you agree? That it would look easier if this was absent. So let's just assume it is absent. I will set it to zero. Why can I do that? Well, you see, there are infinitely many vector potentials that correspond to my magnetic field. And my claim, which we will prove in a moment, is that among these infinitely many, there are some whose divergence is zero. So I can just, instead of choosing, instead of studying any vector potential, I will only study the vector potentials that satisfy this condition. So that is the condition I impose. This is called the Coulomb gauge. This is an arbitrary condition that we impose. Now, if this is satisfied, then this equation simplifies. This term just disappears, and we, are, we end up having Laplacian of A is equal to minus mu zero over four pi times j. Well, we can write it in terms of the Cartesian components, if you like. Laplacian of a x is equal to minus mu zero over four pi j x. Laplacian of a y is equal to minus mu zero over four pi j y. And the Laplacian of a z is equal to minus mu zero over four pi j z. Now, this is an equation that we had already studied in electrostatics. Now, you see, this is the equation that A should satisfy. This is the curl of B should be equal to mu zero over four pi times J. This is our uh, Ampere's equation, right? Do you agree? Curl of B is equal to mu zero over four pi J. Well, I know that B is equal to curl of A. So curl of curl of A should be equal to mu zero over four pi times J. Now, I know what I can expand this curl of curl of J. It is the gradient of the divergence of A minus the Laplacian of A. So this combination has to be equal to this one. Now, if this term is absent, if divergence of A is equal to zero, then this term is absent. So this term should be equal to this one. So minus the Laplacian of A should be equal to mu zero over four pi times J. I just move the minus to the other side, so I end up with this equation. No, it is not zero. It is definitely not zero. No. Curl of A is not the gradient of anything. Curl of curl of... Well, you see, okay, so you are saying that if you think of this as a vector, okay, a vector cross product with another vector B, let's say, no, vector V cross product with another vector, this is perpendicular to V. And we are taking its cross product with vector V. So this is perpendicular to vector V, it's non-zero their scalar product would have been zero, not the cross product. So this identity is basically equivalent to this identity. If you have any three vectors, well, any two of them can be equal to each other. This is always equal to B times A dot C minus A dot B times This doesn't change. You see, if you consider this one, B cross B cross C. Okay, B cross C is perpendicular to B. If you take its cross product with B, it is non-zero. 
B cross C is perpendicular to B. If you take the scalar product with B, it is zero. Because they are orthogonal to each other. Now, we will come back to this point. Why is the divergence of A equal to zero? Why do we impose that? Can we impose that? This is something that just came out of the blue. We chose to impose that condition. Are we allowed to do that? We will come back to that point later on. But if we are allowed to do that, then the Laplacian of A should be equal to this one. And at least in Cartesian coordinates, the Laplacian of a vector field is easy to write. So in Cartesian coordinates, they just reduce to three a Poisson's equation for each one of the components. And we already know how to solve the Poisson's equation. At least the solution, assuming j goes to zero uh, at infinity sufficiently fast, a x, y, or z at the point r will be just mu zero over four pi, integral of j, x, y, z at the point r prime, divided by r minus r prime, d cubed r prime. You see, these are just the, they look like, mathematically speaking, they are identical to the equation satisfied by the scalar potential. The only difference is that here, instead of epsilon zero, we have this mu zero j. And I don't have this four pi over here, right? So I can just use the solutions of these equations that we already obtained in uh, electrostatics. And they are nothing but these ones. Yeah, you see, in electrostatics, instead of mu zero, we had one over epsilon zero. And the coefficient here was one over four pi epsilon zero. So here we have mu zero over four pi. Instead of here in electrostatics, we had rho, the charge, volume charge density. Here we have the volume current density. And this is just the distance from the observation point. The R is our observation point, the point at which we are evaluating the vector potential. R prime is the point that is contributing to the vector potential at the point R. Or in a simpler form, we can write A is equal to mu zero over four pi J at the point R prime divided by R minus r prime, d cubed r prime. Okay, just a warning. Okay, in Cartesian coordinates, if I want to find the x component of A, I use the x component of J. For the y component of A, I use the y component of J, etc. But if you go to other coordinate systems, like the spherical coordinates, let's say the phi co component of A, which will be equal to the vector A at the point R, multiply by, with phi hat at the point R. This will be equal to mu zero over four pi, J at the point R prime, phi at the point r divided by r minus r prime, d cubed r prime. And this is not equal to mu zero over four pi, j phi at the point r prime divided by r minus r prime. They are not equal. So if you want to calculate the phi component of a, you don't integrate the phi component of j. Now, the problem here is j phi at the point r prime would be j at the point r prime, scalar product with phi, the phi hat vector, at the point r prime. Phi hat vector changes from point to point. It's not a constant vector like in the Cartesian coordinates. Our x hat, y hat, and z hat vectors are constant vectors. 
But in spherical coordinates, phi hat vector changes from point to point. Different points have different phi hat vectors. So this scalar product over here, this is j at the point r prime, but this is the phi hat vector at the point r. So this scalar product is not equal to this scalar product. So if you want to calculate the components of A, you should stick with Cartesian co coordinates. Now let's go back to this condition. The divergence of A is equal to zero. Can we assume that the divergence of A is equal to zero all the time? Now let us assume, just make an assumption, we have a vector potential A0. Such that curl of A0 is equal to B and the divergence of A0 is not equal to zero. So we have a vector potential whose divergence is non-zero. So we cannot do the previous treatment to, for this A0. But I have my freedom of changing this A0. To the same B field, there is another vector potential A. Well, there are infinitely many vector potentials A corresponding to the, exactly the same B, such that A would be A0 plus the gradient of some function f. such that the curl of A is also B. So instead of A0, I can also work, work with A0. A, sorry. They will correspond to exactly the same vector potential. Now, is it, the, then the question now is, is it possible to choose this F such that the divergence of A is zero? We know that the divergence of A0 is non-zero, but maybe it can be possible to choose the A F such that the divergence of A will be zero. But the divergence of A is divergence of A0 plus the Laplacian of F. So we want this to be zero. So we want to find some F such that it's Laplacian is equal to minus the divergence of A0. You see, we started with an A0 that we already, we assume that we know, corresponding to our B field. But we already know that for a given B field, there are infinitely many vector potentials. So we are looking for some other vector potential, not the A0, this A which will differ from A0 by the gradient of this F so that they, these two things cor correspond to the same B field. And then the question is, is it possible to choose this F such that the divergence of our new vector potential is zero? How can we find such F? And the answer is, F should be a solution of this equation. As long as F satisfies this equation, then the divergence of this new vector potential is zero. But this is just the Laplace equation and we already know how to solve it. It always has solutions. In fact, here we just have a single equation without any boundary conditions. So if you don't specify the boundary conditions, there are infinitely many solutions of this one, not just one. And hence, for a given vector potential, for, sorry, for a given B field, there are infinitely many vector potentials whose divergence is equal to zero. And this solution that we had obtained, this one, this is the vector potential whose divergence is zero, And that goes to zero at infinity. So in the solutions, we already impose one condition that A goes to zero at infinity.
Now let's prove that the divergence of this solution is zero before continuing. Because we drive this vector potential assuming that the divergence of the vector potential is zero. It's just a consistency check. If, if this vector potential, its divergence is non-zero, then there's something not consistent in our derivation. So let's just prove that our derivation has been consistent. So this is our A. The divergence of A. This is equal to mu zero over four pi times J R prime times the gradient of one over R minus R prime. D cubed R prime. Well, you see the gradient, this del operator, unless I specify otherwise, it, it is the derivatives with respect to the coordinates of R. Now I will do one more trick. This gradient of one over R minus R prime is equal to minus the gradient with respect to the prime coordinates of one over R minus R prime. That minus sign is basically due to this minus sign between the R and R prime. So here I am taking the derivative with respect to the coordinates of R. Here I am taking the derivatives with respect to the coordinate R prime. Now if you put it back, the divergence of A is equal to mu zero over four pi times J of R prime minus the gradient prime of one over R minus R prime. This is equal to mu zero over four pi. Let me move the minus outside. The divergence with respect to the prime coordinates of J of R prime divided by R minus R prime minus one over R minus R prime the divergence of J, d cubed R prime. So here I have the derivative of this term only. So I just write all of that integral as the derivatives of the product. Well, if you take the derivatives of the product, there is this term times the derivative of this one over R minus R prime. That is the term I want but I have the additional term of derivative of J divided by R minus R prime. So that, is, that doesn't appear on the, on the other side. So I have to subtract it. Now this term, this first term, is the volume integral of a divergence. It's nothing but a surface integral. So I can just convert it to a surface integral over the surface of my of space. But that, is, that surface is at infinity where j is zero, so this term is zero, the first term, because it's a surface integral. But since the surface is at infinity, j is zero at that point, so it is automatically zero. Well, the second term is also zero because the divergence of J is zero. Remember, we had this equation, the continuity equation. Which expressed the fact that the electric charge is conserved. If the electric charge at the accumulation of charges at a given point is changing with time, that is because either there, are, there is a current flow towards that point or away from that point, depending on whether the charge is coming or leaving. So if there is a change in charge at a given point, that is due to a flow of charge at that point. So this is what this continuity equation tells us. But in magnetostatics, there is no accumulation of charge anywhere. Since this is zero, 
this also has to be zero in electromagnetostatics. So that is the second term. The second term is contains this divergence of J, which should be zero. So that term is also zero. This is a surface term which is zero, and we end up having equal to zero. So the divergence of A is zero. Of course, provided that electric charge is conserved. And we know that as far as we, we can tell, all the measurements tell us that the electric charge is conserved. So kind of everything is now consistent. Well, if, if our problem is not statics, then the rho by dt need not be zero. Then divergence of j need not be zero. So this expression over here that we wrote, this expression that we wrote wouldn't have divergence of a is equal to zero. But to start with, if we are not in magnetostatics, there is no meaning to this expression anyway. So we obtain, because we obtain this expression assuming we are working in magnetostatics. No. The charge conserved means the total number of charge doesn't change in time. Furthermore, charge is not just conserved, it is locally conserved. Meaning that if you have some volume, let's say over here, it can be just a point or some finite volume, if the charge inside is changing in time, that, is, that can only be because there is a current running over the surface. There is a charge current. The charge inside cannot change otherwise. For example, if, you, if the charge in this volume disappears and appears at the same time at some other place, then charge is still conserved, but not locally conserved. Charge just moved to somewhere else instantly. But this continuity equation tells me that charge is locally conserved. If at a given instant the charge in this volume is changing, it can only be because charge is leaving from the surface of this volume. Sure, it will be. I mean, we will see the examples now. Now, you see, we need to solve these two equations. Okay, so we cannot define a, a scalar potential corresponding to B field in general. In that case, oh, that's not an option because curl of B is not zero. So we have to find some means to solve these two equations. Now, we start by solving this one. It is the easiest one. And we know the general solution of this equation. Whenever I have such an equation, the solution is always can be written in this form. So we are defining this A because this way I can solve this first equation. Now I need to solve the other one. Well, in electrostatics, we had the divergence of E was equal to rho over epsilon zero, and the curl of E was equal to zero. In this case, it was easiest to solve this one in general. And the general solution of this equation was E is equal to minus the gradient of some potential. So this is we use because it solves this equation automatically. Well, in that case, it was nice because, as you pointed out, this is not a vector, so we don't need to deal with vector directions, etc. 
but magnetostatics was not so nice to us as to give our general uh, scalar potential. So we have to live with this vector potential. So we have to keep track of its directions, etc. And as you point out, it will lead to some complications, but there is nothing to avoid them. Let's start with an example. Well, a simple example, at least. Let's take this infinite straight wire. We know the general solution of the vector potential. A at the point R is equal to mu zero over four pi. J at R prime divided by R minus R prime, D cube R prime if we write it in terms of the volume charge density, or this is the same thing as mu zero over four pi times I times DL divided by R minus R prime. Now keep in mind that we always have these relationships. If we have a volume charge density, then J times dV is equal to I times DL for a current carrying wire, it will become uh, K, this is the surface current times the S for a surface current. So that is basically what I use by going from the, in going from the first line to the second line. Instead of J times dV, I just replace I times DL. And let's say, here, this is my point R. I just take some DL over here. This is my DL. DL is at the point R prime. This is R prime. This is my R. Now, first of all, DL vector, if we choose this R, as our z-axis, the L vector always points in the z-direction. So this is equal to the L in the z-direction. So the vector potential also has only the z-component. It doesn't have the x or the y-components. Just like the current, current only has the z-component, the current density, so does the vector potential has only the z-component. So AX is equal to AY. These are two are zero. And AZ, this is equal to mu zero over four pi I times DL over R minus R prime. Let me define some other variables. This length, or this vector, is r minus r prime. Let us assume our point is at a distance d, no, at a distance r from the wire. Let me also call this angle theta. Now, first of all, this R minus R prime, or let's write capital R divided by R minus R prime. This is equal to sine of theta, or one over R minus R prime. This is equal to sine theta over R. So if I do, just divide, there's a right triangle over there. If I divide R by the length 
the distance between my DL vector and R. That is nothing but the sine of theta. So R over this distance is my sine of theta. And in my integral, I need the 1 over R minus R prime. That is sine theta over R. And let's say this length is L. R over L Now, R over L is just tangent theta. Or L is equal to R over R times cotangent theta. So DL is equal to So let's remember a bit of calculus. Minus one, minus one hmm? Okay, your answer is correct. So now we can just put it back az is equal to mu 0 over 4 pi i dl is minus r over sine squared theta d theta 1 over r minus r prime is sine theta over r so r's cancel sine theta cancels one of them so this is equal to mu 0 over 4 pi minus times i d theta over sine theta. Now, what are the limits of theta? Why minus pi? Well, you see, look at this relation that I defined over here. Capital R is a positive number. This is a positive number. So I define theta to be a positive angle. Sine of theta has to be positive. You cannot go to negative angles. So this relation already fixes, since both of these are always positive, this, if you want to make this definition, you have to make sure that theta is always sine of theta is always positive. So that is one condition on theta. But you are kind of right. Theta goes from 0 to pi or pi to 0. So you see, if, this is my point. If you take this DL and take it down, so eventually, this, as the DL goes in the minus, moves in the minus that direction, this angle gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually, it will be zero. If, on the other hand, if you take this segment DL in the positive, move it in the positive Z direction, well, we are basically summing over all of them, so we have to consider all of them, then this angle we get, will get larger and larger it will reach pi over 2, and then it will get larger than pi over 2. Eventually, it will reach pi. So at least the limits, one of the limits is 0. The other limit is pi. So is the lower limit 0 or the upper limit 0? That's the next thing. Now let's look at the definitions. This dl over here is positive. We defined it to be positive. The L vector, the current is running in the plus z direction. So this dl, the component in the z direction, which we call dl, has to be positive. Now let's look at our transition from dl to d theta. This is positive. That's for sure. r is positive, sine squared theta is positive. We have a minus sign over here. So d theta should be negative. Theta should be taking smaller and smaller values since dl is positive. So we are basically going from plus infinity to minus infinity. Plus uh, z is equal to plus infinity to z is equal to minus infinity so that the theta is negative. So theta goes from pi to 0. It's 
since the data has to be positive. Part, sorry, the data has to be negative because DL has to be positive. That is how we define DL. Okay, again, this integral is one of the integrals which I never, I can never remember. Anybody remembers what this integral is? In that case, let's drive it from pi to zero over twice sine theta over two, cosine theta over two, sine squared theta over two plus cosine squared theta over two. E theta. This is nothing but sine theta, and this is nothing but one. Why I did that? Well, the resulting integrals are easy to integrate. Minus mu zero over eight pi i from pi to zero, sine of theta over two, divided by cosine of theta over two, plus cosine of theta over two, divided by sine of theta over two, d theta, which will be minus mu zero over four pi i, logarithm of sine theta over two, divided by cosine theta over two. With a factor of two, theta from zero to pi. What is sine pi over two? Sine pi and cosine, well, let's look at the lower limit theta is equal to zero, tangent zero is zero, logarithm of zero is infinity. Oops. It diverges. Almost to get it coming. Sorry, it's pi to zero. When you say theta is equal to zero, it diverges. When you say theta is equal to pi, you get the logarithm of minus one, well, which is weirder, to say the least. So that is break time. Now, any questions before you go? Well, in fact, we did see an, a similar infinity in electrostatics. Do you remember? We did see such an infinity in electrostatics also, not just in magnetostatics. Yep, exactly the same problem here. If you have an infinite wire, you cannot set the potential at the vector potential at infinity to zero. So that is what we need to avoid. Okay, we will do that after the break. Yes, if you, in the electrostatics, if you had an infinite wire uniformly charged, we couldn't set the potential at infinity to zero. Because if we would set the potential at infinity to zero, we would obtain infinite potential at everywhere. Now we were just setting the potential to be zero at some arbitrary point, at a finite distance. <laughs> 